All right, hello and welcome to the Daily Space for today, October 23rd, 2019. I am your host, Annie Wilson. Most Mondays through Fridays, either I or my co-host, Dr. Pamela Gay, will be here bringing you, you know, news updates on everything space and astronomy news related. It's Wednesday, so yeah, you know what that means. It means we talk rockets. So today we have two technology demonstrations because there were only two launches within the last week and a Japanese a Japanese satellite re-entry. Oof, words are hard, y'all. Anyways, let's get at it, shall we? We shall. All right, first up, last week on October 20... Nope, nope, on October 17th, remember, words are hard, at 1.22 a.m. UTC Rocket Lab launched the As the Crow Flies mission on an electron rocket. So before we talk about the launch, let's check out their launch patch. So the launch patch for As the Crow Flies features six stars and there's one, two, three white stars, two blue stars. All of those are four pointed and one nine pointed star. Three, um, mm, I just realized my script and I had the, had a deviation. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Um, there's also an outline of a satellite with an orbital path that is superimposed, superimposed upon the earth, which sits behind a mountain range or a rocky outcrop. As far as symbolism goes, because rocket launches are, or not rocket launches, but launch patches and mission patches tend to be heavy on the symbolism, or at least have some symbolism in there, and Rocket Lab is no exception. I'm fairly certain that the satellite outline represents the payload for this mission. The nine pointed star is probably a reference to the fact that this is Rocket Lab's ninth launch. And as far as all six stars in total, Astro Digital, who is the customer for this launch, currently has six satellites in orbit. So I'm going to take a leap of faith and assume that's what each star represents. I couldn't find any information on the mountains or the um, rocky outcropping, but Astro Digital is in Santa Clara, California, and my understanding is that there are some mountain ranges nearby, so that might be why that's there, but beyond that, I, I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue. So, all right, this was only the second time that Rocket Lab had a sole passenger on the launch. Um, so what was that passenger? A screen grab of the launch broadcast by every day. No, let me fix that. A screen grab of the launch broadcast captured by everyday astronauts shows the kick stage, which is this weird looking thing uh, just right of the engine with a big black box on it. Uh, that big black box is Palisade. It is a 16 unit CubeSat developed and built by Astro Digital, the customer. Palisade is meant to be a technology demonstration. Other than that, <laughs> there have been zero public statements on its purpose. Zero. So, I would just like to note that Palisade does strongly resemble Astro Digital's Corvus XL arrangement. That's not highly unusual since the whole concept of the Corvus platform is to provide cost efficient and flexible options for customers. Um, I'm not entirely too sure how big the XL is. This may actually be the Corvus 16, you know, 16 unit, 16 unit or Corvus 16 being a 16 unit CubeSat. This was a 16 unit CubeSat. Corvus 6 has is a six unit CubeSat. So the 16 unit CubeSat's quite a bit bigger, but not huge. And I really couldn't find any information for the XL, meaning I don't know how big it is, but you know, it's a big black box. It's just kind of chilling on the kick stage and without knowing a whole lot more of 
dimensions and so on and so forth, um, it's hard to see. So Dave would like to note that all of these images, all of these satellites in this image are in scale to another. So a 16 unit is that much bigger than the six, the HP looks like it's just a 16 unit with, I hesitate to say flappy wings, but really it looks like more, uh, looks like additional solar panels. And the XL might be 20 units or more. It might be 20 units or more. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it just, it's unfortunate that solar panels look like flappy wings. Remember, that's not how they're oriented in space. They're really oriented to get the most sunlight they can. Whew, whew, whew. Okay, so I have launch video and this is your warning that rocket launches are loud. This is your one and only warning that rocket launches are loud. So let's see if it's going to play at the right spot. Commanding deluge enabled. Deluge running. And I started at minus T30, so we're going to have to wait a little bit. Systems. re readying engines. As Hanny says, it's time to scare the sheep. Yes, there are sheep right next to the launch pad. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Lift off. There it goes, just like that. All all the stuff you see falling it's off of the rocket. It's just As the crow ice. flies has left the nest and we have liftoff. The forces against the rocket are increasing as electron travels through the Earth's atmosphere. Soon we'll approach the point where forces are at their strongest. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. Or maximum uh, aerodynamic pressure. So let's check. This entire video is indeed available on YouTube. So if you would like to relive the launch, you can either go back and watch our launch party stream, or you can uh, go watch it on their YouTube channel as well. So um, please note, and this will be important in, the, in a little bit, please note that all of the, um, I'm not sure what the technical word is, I want to say exhaust or fumes or let's just call them clouds actually. Please note that all the clouds surrounding um, the rocket as it took off uh, was white. So the reason behind that is because Rocket Lab uses cooled, super cooled liquid hydrogen and oxygen, which when they come together form water. Pretty cool. You will understand why this is important in a second. Okay, on to the next launch that happened last week. Also on October 17th, Oh, exhaust bloom is the typical term. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so also on October 17th at 3.21 PM UTC, a China Long March 3 Bravo rocket launched the Tango Juliet Sierra Whiskey-4 mission. So TJSW-4 is the fourth of a series of experimental satellites that is probably destined for a geostationary orbit. While we don't know the exact nature of the satellite, China claims it is a techno. Mm. China claims it is a technology. I'm just going to go with technology demonstration of multi-band high-speed communication techniques. The lack of public information about this particular satellite's particular satellite and the other three in this series may mean that it is really intended for military use. 
So we did not stream this launch. Chinese launches are typically not live streamed. Um, but I do have photos and video. So this is a nighttime photo taken by Guai, gu, mm, words are hard. Guai Wenbin, Guai Wenbin? Yeah, we're going with that. Guai Wenbin of that same Long March 3 Bravo liftoff. It is visually stunning with the yellows, oranges, and reds of the exhaust bloom at the moment of launch. This gorgeous display is due to the highly toxic dinitro dinitrogen and tetraoxide and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Oof. We like to call that UDMH because it is a mouthful. Used as fuel in the strap-on boosters first and second stages. The third stage uses liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So if these two materials are highly toxic, why are they still used as full? fuel? Quite simply, they're stable. As long as they don't touch, they're stable. Um, and they could be stored for quite some time without the use of any special cooling or pressurization systems, much like solid fuel. Whew. Oh, oh. So, yeah, it's a very pretty picture. Chinese launches are very, very pretty, but I don't want to be anywhere near them. Nope, 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 nope. So, I have launch video. Um, this comes from China Central Television. Rocket launches are loud. I don't think this one is too loud. Um, yeah. <sighs> okay. Some shots of the control room. The strap on booster is falling away. First stage, you know, fairing. And second stage, and now it's onto that third stage, which uses the liquid hydrogen and oxygen. I'd like to pause here and let you get a glimpse of the satellite. This is the only known image, rendering, whatever, of this particular satellite. It is that secretive. And there's been some speculation on what parts are what, but um, it's really hard to, uh, it's really hard to say what exactly everything is. I'm gonna just rewind and leave it there. So another thing to mention is that yes, this was the 315th launch of the Long March rocket series. And there's at least three or four of them and they're developing a fifth. So um, Kerbal says, looks like a copy of Europeans Galileo-ish. I, I don't know. I saw some speculation on what it is. It is meant to be uh, communications, I believe. China already has uh, their own global navigation satellite system called Beidou which is not all that secretive. They know it, you know, everybody knows it exists kind of thing. Um, but these are one of the, uh, the words are hard today. <laughs> they really are. But this is one of the satellites that they are keeping very close to the chest. And I am very surprised that they even released an animation of it in because of the crudeness of the animation, you really can't get a whole lot of information about it anyways, other than it's a satellite with uh, solar panels. I'm sure people that know satellites much better than this, much better than me can pull more information than this, but I'm, I'm not even gonna speculate, really. Anyways, those were the two launches for this past week. And let's get on to that uh, Japanese satellite, shall we? So JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, recently announced that... Mm, 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 I suck at Japanese. 
Tsuba May, Tsuba May satellite, also known as SLATS, which is how I'm going to call it from here on out. SLATS stands for Super Low Altitude Test Satellite, deorbited on October 2nd, ending an almost three year mission, which tested the ability of an Earth imaging camera to operate at very low altitudes with the help of a xenon fueled ion engine. This engine helped. Uh, the satellites stay aloft despite the aerodynamic drag, which JAXA states can be approximately 1,000 times greater than that of most Earth observation satellites at an altitude of 600 to 800 kilometers. This satellite launched aboard an H2 Alpha rocket on December 23rd, 2017. Both the craft and the rocket were designed and built by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Corporation. So this image is one that uh, SLATS took of the same intersection in Tokyo. The image on the left was taken at an altitude of about 380 kilometers or 260 miles. While the image on the right was taken later using the same camera and settings at its lowest sustained altitude of 180 kilometers or 110 miles. So it's the one that's closer on the right is indeed much more in focus and you can actually make out clearly the edges of the buildings, the crosswalks, the sidewalks. Meanwhile, on the left, you kind of have to guess at what you're looking at. So to Subame, which means barn swallow, was able to maintain useful altitude attitude and altitude despite encountering drag forces, which usually cause objects to quickly deorbit and burn up due to atmospheric friction after being placed into an initial elliptical orbit with a perigree or a low point of about 392 kilometers or 243 miles above the earth the jaxa controllers at first allowed the satellite to be lowered gradually by the atmosphere to a more circular orbit of 271 kilometers or 167 miles Satellite was then able to use its low thrust xenon fueled electric engine to stabilize at that altitude for about a month before shutting the engine off to allow the satellite's orbit to gradually decay to lower and lower orbits in the sequence. First, it was at 250 kilometers, then 240 kilometers, and then 230 kilometers. Satellite was able to maintain each of these orbits with its low thrust engine and did so for about a week at each altitude before allowing the atmosphere to take over once again. It was then able to conduct a month's worth of operations at an altitude of 217 kilometers before being lowered again, once again, to an altitude of 181 kilometers this past September. Uh, the ion thruster was able to maintain this altitude for a full week and what looks like finally to an orbit of 167 kilometers. Uh, at this altitude, the craft was finally forced to use its liquid-fueled main engine in conjunction with the ion thruster to maintain the orbit. And JAXA reports that it deorbited after completing all of its scheduled experiments. Um, do, 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 do. In addition to testing technologies designed to enable the potential economic and operational benefits of being able to launch smaller satellites to lower orbits using less expensive sensor suites, potentially on less expensive payload deployment systems, JAXA also tested a special coating designed to combat the effects of atmospheric oxygen, which is different than the typical O2. Uh, atomic oxygen, not atmospheric oxygen, my apologies, which is known to damage the materials which typically coat the outer surfaces of satellites. According to JAXA, for SLATs, countermeasures have been taken, uh, such as applying a coating which is highly resistant to atomic oxygen to the outer surface of the multi-layer insulation. SLATs is also equipped with an with the atomic oxygen monitoring system, which measures the concentration of atomic oxygen and the deterioration of materials when reacting with that atomic oxygen. The acquired data will be used in design of future super low altitude satellites. And this is an artist's conception of the SLATS satellite. Um, Xenon thruster was also used on the Hayabusa uh, spacecraft, including uh, by Hayabusa spacecraft that's actually plural, including the one that's currently orbiting the asteroid Ryugu. 
Um, but xenon gas thruster used on slats was originally developed for the much larger Kiku Number no. Eight communications spacecraft, and it offers more thrust than the asteroid explorers had available. So that's pretty cool, and that is all of Dave. You can thank Dave for that last story. So I'm going to switch over to chat. And we're going to talk about this new story because some of this is beyond what I know. And I am so glad that Dave is here for this. So yes, shout out to Dave Ballard or our instro in chat for helping me out with, as always, with these Rocket Wednesday uh, slides. And he is totally the one that pulled the JAXA story for y'all. So, um, yeah, Dave is awesome. Dave is awesome. Um, so I'm going to scroll up. So broken symmetry asks, are the brighter white areas in the Jaxa photo reflected sunlight? It's probably, oh, thanks for the follow base gleamer. I don't have the dogs up, but, and make it rain. Um, it's probably, it probably is more reflected sunlight simply because those areas are lighter, like, I know sidewalks in my neck of the woods or my area tend to be much lighter in color than the roads because the roads in my area are typically made out of asphalt, which is either really black or kind of gray and sidewalks tend to be made out of concrete, which is um, really light gray to white. So an aerial photo would definitely show the different um, brightnesses or light reflected. Isn't that a Play-Doh? I don't, I don't know if that's the technical term. Um, Hanny's S. So it used ion thrusters instead of hydrazine to change position. Does that mean it could pot potentially, could do this potentially forever? Um, our instro answers, cause he is the one that knows way more about this than I do. Uh, that's correct. Not forever for much, much longer than hydrazine. So, uh, DPI asks, what about Rockets Labs plans to send payload to the moon? Since it's a slow launch week next week, uh, we will probably talk about Rocket Labs, uh, plans to send payload to the moon next week, simply so we have things to talk about. Um, uh, that's kind of the tricky part when there's a slow launch because a slow launch week, because I'm like, well, I need three stories. Um, I'm scrolling up to see if there's anything else. Do, 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 do. And more bits for the dogs. Ah! Make it rain. There you go, Tink. Um, So, um, ooh, slats had been, it, our instro adds, if slats had been able to scoop atmosphere as well, that could possibly have extended somewhat, but not indefinitely. <sighs> Kerbal says, I remember hearing that KH Gambit would dive down to about 100 kilometers to get super high resolution imagery. Has that, is that in orbit now? Is that a future mission? What is that? Candy says, the dog, the pause on the hardwood sounds like the dogs are typing. I know, right? I know, right? They are, they are hilarious. Just give me one second and I'll get them back up on screen for y'all. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, more bits. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce your name. And make it rain, Euchre Man. I'm gonna go with Euchre Man. Um, Dave replies to Kerbal, yes, it did this by way of making its own orbit more elliptical so it didn't have to use as much fuel to stay down there and fight drag constantly. Um, oh, it was a C, oh, oh, wait. KH as in like key holder? Yeah, key holder. Okay, now are we doing? Now, now we're talking about. Okay, now I know what you're talking about. Um, Hanny's asked, "Is this supposed to be a spy satellite or environment?" Um, I think it's just meant to be 
I think it's just meant to be imagery uh, because imagery can have spy satellite or spy uh, satellite conditions. It could be that. I I don't I don't know. I don't know what the nature of this was other than let's see how low we can fly this satellite. Uh, Broken Symmetry asks, can satellite photos tell me if the hair on the top of my head is thinning? Come on. You know it's much easier just to take a picture with your phone or a camera of the top of your head and get that answer. That seems like a... I guess, I guess the mailman's here. Mail, mail carrier, excuse me. Um, yeah, um, that just doesn't... Come on, come here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, that just seems like not a good use of expensive satellite time because I'm sure even though we have a bunch of satellites <coughs> humans are talking um, <coughs> look what I got post officer yeah something like that Come here, I got the good treats. If you come here, you get the good treat. She's like, I don't know about this. I'm just gonna stand right off screen. Okay, um, kitty. Uh, yeah, the dogs probably are gonna wake up the cat. Um, oh, the H&G programs were the ones that used C-130s to catch the film canisters before re-entering orbit. Oh my goodness. <sighs> Broken Symmetry is like, I don't really wanna know if I'm thinning. I'm just gonna get a hat, okay. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, H and G programs were the ones. Oh yeah, we already talked about that. And uh, keyhole, yes, keyhole eleven capabilities were recently demonstrated. So uh, you may want to <laughs> you may want to use one of those Hubble class army satellites for important hair thinning observation. I mean, I still say that's awfully expensive. I still say that's awfully expensive. Um, Ernstro says, the ones that have been, the ones that have inspired, among others, Rocket Labs to try and catch their first stages. Yes, because before we had digital, satellites used film, and we either had to send humans up to go change out the film, or get the film, or we had to catch the film as it parachuted down. I'm not joking. This is real stuff. Uh, sometimes it's hard for me to remember that yes there was a time before you know we just beamed everything digitally down but yes um yeah yeah and that is indeed as dave said the inspiration for catching uh for stages with a you know a uh, parachute because that's just easier and if um quite frankly if they miss the parachute the first stage is going to go into the ocean which is better than you know going in to somebody's cow field. So somebody was asking about cow counter for this uh, for this last Chinese launch. I have not seen any images of debris. Otherwise, I would have included them. <laughs> Are you done? I know. The, the bad thing about living on a quiet street. Um, yeah, we, we just... I don't... There weren't any debris photos there might not be for a while oh wow we were russia launched their last film return satellite in 2015 um hanny's asked is catching the first stage as good as getting prices down as the way spacex lands um it will bring down the cost of launch i don't know how much it's going to bring down the cost of launch and that's simply because they don't have to build another booster um another first stage they'll already have that first stage there um, and because they use batteries to power their engines, it's not entirely electric. They use electric to power the engines 
to burn the, the liquid fuel that they use. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if they plan on attempting to recharge the batteries because I think they're lithium ion and can be recharged. Um, these are all things that I just don't quite know. I don't know if they're going to try to capture the other batteries or, you know, all the other batteries that have been swapped out during the hot swaps are just going to burn up in the atmosphere. So, um, wow, DPI to the rescue with information. Rocket Lab launches are comparatively reasonable already. It's six million US dollars a launch. That's about the cost of Falcon's payload fairings. Yes, Electron is much smaller than Falcon 9. Um, Arnstra adds, they will also not need the sophisticated attitude directional control system, both hardware and software, software that Falcon stages do. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, kind of the difference is, is that SpaceX could, it could be claimed that SpaceX over-engineered or very highly engineered their things to come down, uh, the way that a Rocket Lab is planning on doing it. They don't need to add stuff to their, uh, first stages. They just have to catch it. So I take it back. They have to add a parachute or two or four, but that's still not the same as having a whole bunch of software and hardware to literally make it land. So, um, base lemur says, wait, wait, what are you saying? The total cost to launch rocket, uh, total, total cost to launch for rocket lab is $6 million. Yes. Yes. Um, they are very much limited as Dave goes on to say the size of the payload and the orbits available. Um, it's a smaller rocket, it can't lift as much stuff, but, and it can't go to all the available orbits, because some of the orbits available are really high away from the surface of the Earth and require a whole lot more fuel to get there. Rocket Lab's like, all right, we can take this much weight, mass, payload, whatever, to this orbit, and if your uh, payload meets those criteria, like, for example, Astro Digitals with the with um, with their latest uh, technology demonstration. That's a good deal. Um, Hanny's asks, how long can the other rocket companies go on without a reusable solution? Not a clue. I do not know enough about rockets to know that. Um, Eukerman points out parachutes weigh a lot, though. They do, but they require a whole lot less uh, fiddling with software and hardware to get them to work the way that they're intended. Um, Electron has a capability of 500 pounds to 600 kilometers uh, sun synchronous orbit, according to DPI. Um, Bad Panda Bear asks, is ULA still planning to catch the Vulcan for stage engine? Um, I don't know. Trekker Kev is, uh, kind of giving, uh, DPI a hard time because of mixing of units. And make it, uh, make it rain! Kerbal says SpaceX tried using parachutes to slow down Falcon 1 stages. They broke up due to aerodynamic forces before the chutes could deploy. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. Um, that is terrifying. DPI says, I recall reading that as the crow flies was a height record for rocket labs. I didn't get that much into it. I don't, if they put it out on their Twitter, I didn't quite catch it. Um, yeah. Um, Arnstra goes on to talk about the launch requirements. Uh, until things like Starline are heavier available, there are still non-reusables that have a place in the market. And yes, as Larry points out, China and ESA are working on reusability too. Um, because, oh, they said on the webcast, and then I missed it. I missed it, Kerbal. A hundred, no, not a hundred, a thousand kilometers circular. And they said that on the webcast for As the Crow Flies. Obviously, my short-term memory is is crap. Um, yeah, 
There's, like I said, I know enough. Oh, it was in a tweet. Okay, I must just not have read that tweet. I'm gonna put the special treats down. Um. Yeah. There's, there's a lot going on, and, and sometimes it's just enough to, to capture. And I still don't know everything there is to know about rockets, and I'm still learning. So, yeah. Yeah. We're, uh, we're getting there. Together, we're getting there. Isn't that right, Tinkerbell? 500 pounds to 600 miles. <laughs> Dave hopefully, uh, hopefully converts for those of us that are still more used to uh, freedom units. Imperial units, and I think that's the cat, and I don't even know if I have a treat for him. So, any other questions, comments, smart remarks before the cat makes his, uh, I like Mega Meter. That's easier to, I mean, it's easier to say, but I guess it doesn't, if you're not used to Mega, you're not used to, uh, seeing it. Oh, come here, bud. I know. Come here. Where are you? Because the internet likes cats. Ugh. Because the internet likes cats. Did the dogs wake you up? The dogs did wake you up. Yeah, the cat is not a baby. He just sounds like, like a baby. Did the dogs wake you up? Okay. Um, Broken Symmetry asked, did anybody see or photograph the Orionids shower? I had overcast weather through three states. I did not. Uh, Youngstown is infamous for always being cloudy, which, yeah. I mean, I know people think of Seattle as being cloudy and miserable and, and stuff, but we, it's not that we're always cloudy, it's just that there's almost always clouds in the sky. And as it gets closer to winter, it's just always going to be overcast all the time. So, um... As long as we don't describe orbits in the amounts of micro AU. I agree, DPI. Uh, AU is, uh, stands for astronomical unit, and that is literally, I think it's the average distance, or the average of the distances between the Earth and the Sun. Um, to be super technical, if you're not being technical, it's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So yeah, Nightbot actually already has a command for that. Uh, our instro says the Orionids are still going on. Okay, cool. Only the peak has a set time. The actual shower will persist for up to two weeks before and after. Beard seconds, nanoparsecs, no. These are not acceptable. <laughs> these are not acceptable units, y'all. I don't, I don't even know what a beard second is. I don't even know what a beard second is. Ah. <sighs> Elonian time? No. If a train originates from the center of Orion, then it is an Orionid. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Based Lemur says, a beard second is, is the length of a, a beard grows in a second? Like, oh my. Oh my. Uh, oh, green fireballs at this time of year are often Orionids. Awesome. That, that is good to know. I probably won't see these things be simply because of where I live. And I live in the city. So, there's that. Um, what? Cat's like, I just, I just want some love. Cat's like, okay, I'm done now. Um, anything else? It is a quarter to two, and I apparently still do not have a happy cat. Um, I still have to record the podcast, and that's going to take me a bit. Ooh. Orionids, Leonids, yeah, these are all a lot that I'm, I'm keeping to keep those. <sighs> More with the weird units. Hemi says, I think the moon moves away from the earth about one year of nail growth a year or something. Yeah, he definitely has a very distinctive meow. Um, I'm not sure if it's because he's hungry or what. I'm gonna see if I can put together the... Aha! 
Um, but yeah, yeah. I love all the chatter, but I, I do have other things to get done. Uh, if you would like a clean version of the uh, broadcast without dogs crying or uh, cats meowing, even though Broken Symmetry is like equal representation for cats in science chats, uh, we do have a podcast that is recorded separately and is typically much shorter and much more concise. New definition of clean version. Well, Euchre Man, when you have dogs that bark and you have cats that meow and you know you have some, some members of your audience that are just on the go or uh, you know, just don't want to listen to uh, dogs or cats or you know rambling people, a clean version works. Beautiful darks. Beautiful barks. Aw, thank you, one girl. Um, the cat... As far as equal representation for the cat on the stream, um, he's very old and he sleeps a lot. He is definitely, uh, he's definitely an old cat and yes, the dogs barking wake him up and he, then he wants food. So, which I think is what you want, either that or to go outside. So, Kerbal says, I sleep a lot. Ooh, waffles. But yeah, um, unless you guys have any... Candy says, UPS is here! No, that was the neighbor honking their horn at somebody else to get out of the house, and this is a pet peeve of mine. Anyways, all right, so I've had enough rambling, so I'm gonna set up another marker for uh, Susie. And, um, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thanks for tuning in, Rigel. So yeah, it's, it's wall of text time, y'all. It's wall of text time. So, this has been a production of PSI, that's Planetary Science Institute. Uh, working in collaboration with Youngstown State University here in Youngstown. Oh gosh, I hope it's not terrible outside today. Ohio! <laughs> um, PSI is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, which is just fancy speak for your tax donations, or your donations are tax deductible where the laws allow. We are here because of you, so thank you for everything y'all do. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for, you know, putting up with my critters. We might might have a cat on the dog cam, but I don't think so. Um, up, 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 look, it's a cat on the dog cam. It's a cat on the dog cam. <laughs> so thank you for your bits, your uh, subs, your pledges on Patreon, your donations, your... Oh, thank you! Thank you, Rigel! Thank you so much! Um, thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Lots of, lots of bits for the dogs for that. Thank you. Um... Make it rain! Thank you so much. Uh, but yeah, we're here because of you, so... Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you! Yeah! Um... Y'all are amazing. <laughs> Y'all are amazing. <laughs> and if you can't afford to, uh... If you can't afford to, uh... Fit subs, merch, Patreon, whatever, that's fine, too. Uh... Follows are free. Subscribing to us on uh, YouTube is free. Subscribing to our podcast is free. Hanging out with us is free. Joining our Discord is free. Just, it's okay to just hang out with us. Oh, and more bits. All right, so this is how much things I got left. And I'll just dump the rest of that. And it's two jelly beans. Two jelly beans. All right, we'll do this real quick. Mm, bad one. No? Yes? And that one's a good one. It's a good one. And of course I can't swallow. That one's not a good one. Alright, so we're... 
what one good one and mm, three bad ones mm, something like that <laughs> if i think about it is it really a good one i don't know this is just a champagne one mm, okay all right so we're cut up on on jelly beans we're cut up on bits and subs i am out of cheerios to throw at the dogs so uh yeah i think i think it's time to awkwardly roll the credits as we do oof thank you again all um wherever you are in the world have a wonderful insert time of day here and yeah <sighs> yeah Dave says, these and other questions answered in the next Daily Space or, you know, the next Rocket Roundup. Yeah, we'll get to these. We'll get to these things. But again, thank you all for all of your support. Uh, there is a Weekly Space Hangout um, simulcast. And I'm not sure who it is tonight. Evelyn McDonald is the guest tonight. Uh, I encourage you all to check it out. I, I think that's it. 8 p.m. Eastern. So yeah, come check it out. Paranor will be hosting that. And uh, yeah, I will see you all. Oh no, that's the 30th. Well, they cut off the 23rd, so I don't know who it is. Oh, thanks. Well, I'm glad you joined us, Space Gleamer. I'm glad you joined us. Um, we stream Sundays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Right now that's 1700 hours UTC. Uh, Sundays is Science Sunday with me, hi, and uh, we usually colorize space telescope photos, and Monday through Friday is this, Daily Space, and it's, you know, usually a quick, quick uh, astronomy and space news update. So, yeah. Oh, the, tonight the guest is Aline Yinkst, I probably slaughtered that and she is a space geologist all right yes yes tune in for tonight's uh, weekly space hangout i think it's going to be awesome so yes again thank you to everybody you all are awesome and you all make this possible and um my dogs just love the cheerios so wherever you are in the world have a wonderful insert time of day here and i will see you soon bye